So Grey Bears Nation, we got a special guest for you guys this week. Uh, I dare call this individual a basketball lifer. Uh, not only did he play basketball throughout his college career, immediately jumped into coaching uh, from an assistant and a head coach standpoint, a large stint at Division I College Siena, a large stint uh, being an assistant at places like Wisconsin, and has spent uh, the last part of probably 15 years, I would say, uh, coaching in the NBA as an assistant coach and uh, coach some of the who's who. And uh, most recently is serving as an assistant coach with the Sacramento Kings. And it's our pleasure and our honor to welcome Bob Byers to the Gray Bears podcast. Yes, sir. We got Bob Byers. What up, coach? Welcome, welcome. Yo, yo, what's up, fellas? Appreciate you most. Thanks for that intro. Thank you. <laughs> you, you got it. And, and I probably undersold you, Bob. But the Gray Bears Nation knows that we start this podcast with two questions every week. So, Bob, how did you spend your week and what are you sipping on? Well, I'm kind of low-keyed right now. I made that cross-country flight from Sacramento. I'm in Saratoga Springs right now. I'm just sipping on a little sparkling water right now and enjoying the beauties of small town USA Saratoga Springs. Nice. That is nice. a great way to spend your week. Saratoga is a beautiful place any time of the year, but especially this time of the year. You left the big city of Sacramento? I left the big city of Sacramento. <laughs> Hope you're getting down on sack now. That's the big <laughs> There's a lot of big wigs out there now. Come on. Okay. Sack down. So, Bob, you talked about that cross-country flight. And, and, again, we're truly grateful any time to have you on, but in particular this time, because there's never been a more unique time, probably in the history of the NBA, than what the league is going through uh, at this point. And you have firsthand knowledge of what it was like to be in the bubble. But before we jump in the bubble, I'm really curious. Once you first heard that the bubble was going to take place, what was your first impressions? What, what immediately went through your mind? Well, once I found out we were going to be in Orlando, the first thing was, yes, from this standpoint, we're one of the top 22 teams to get invited, and it gave us a legitimate shot to make the playoffs. That was my very first reaction. Then when the schedule came out, we had to play three scrimmage games, and then we were going to play eight seeding games. That was exciting because we could then determine our fate on the court. Mm -hmm. That was my very first reaction. Then shortly after that, to be quite honest, I was a little bit like anxious because we were traveling all the way across the country and at the time going into a hot spot with the COVID-19 in Florida. Mm -hmm. And then everyone proposed, well, it's going to be a bubble situation. A lot of precautions are going to be like talked about and discussed. But when you don't go through anything or it's the first time you're going to be exposed to it, yep. there was just a lot of natural questions that popped into my mind. And I'm going to ramble here a little bit. No, but the, please, oh, please. Yeah. The first thing I really want to say from the NBA's organization of putting the bubble together, they could not have done a better job. So as soon as we landed and we took our charter flight from Sacramento directly to Orlando, we got on a bus, we went directly to our hotel, we had a meeting, they scanned us in and they told us how the protocols were gonna be. We were in quarantine for 39 hours initially where we never left our hotel room and they had food delivered right to our doors. They put a magic band is what they call it on our wrist. So every time we left the hotel, to the conference center, to the gym, we would always have to scan in and out so everyone was accounted for. They did a great job with the security. We were tested on a daily basis that we had to take our own temperature even before we could uh, leave our room. And then we had COVID tested on, on a daily basis. So all the nurses, all the support staff people that got tested on a regular basis, they really did an unbelievable job of making sure players, staff were all gonna be protected as best they could. Wow. You know, that is, is great to hear because from afar, 
we have that assumption because the bubble's going off without a hitch, but to hear it from somebody that, that actually lived there. And I know the fellas are going to jump in, but just one more quest- question before you guys got to Orlando. What were those team meetings like with you guys, with the coaches and the players prior to getting in, on that plane and going down to Orlando? Well, you know, I'm very fortunate to work with Luke Walton. And Luke is 40, and he's very in tune with, everything that's going around our team, both within society. And I'm sure we'll get into it a little bit here with the COVID. And at that time, the George Floyd incident that took place. So Luke was very aggressive in setting up Zoom calls. And more than anything else, he wanted the players to express what they were feeling. And again, whenever you go through or about ready to go through a new situation, sometimes the best remedy is to get it out and talk. And NBA teams are like no other team. We're, we're, we're the same, right? We're the same as your high school team. We're the same as your college team. We become a little family. Right. And guys can help each other out. And we talked about a lot of things in our Zoom conversations, even before we went to Orlando. And then um, they actually set up COVID tested for us 10 days prior for us even to get down there just to make sure everyone was a negative test. And we unfortunately had a couple guys that tested positive and they had to stay back in Sacramento before they could uh, join us in Orlando. Uh, so, so Bob, um, you know, what you said about Luke Walton was great, you know, in terms of him being aggressive and being in tune with the team and things like that. You know, I think as fans sometimes, you know, we can all get caught up and forget that these are human beings, you know, we get so, we get so caught up in that in the game. So did you see, what did you see in terms of the players, the impact on the players, whether it be emotional or physically, is that adjustment uh, getting into the bubble and getting underway? So we have 17 players. We took 17 players with us. And I'm not kidding. There's 17 different personalities. And some guys are very outgoing, and they will just kind of express what they're feeling. Some of our younger guys, again, um, didn't really know. And there was pressure on us from this standpoint, from a play standpoint. Guys put pressure on themselves to play well so that we had a shot of making the playoffs. So Sacramento hasn't been in the playoffs in 14 years now. And I think looking back in retrospect, the guys put a little bit too much pressure on themselves to play well. And really, I think the guys just wanted to help each other out as best they could. Um, You know, it wasn't anything really specific. And some guys, you know, actually had to travel all the way back into Sacramento um, before we traveled down together. But there was a certain vibe, a certain sense of togetherness. We're going to tackle this. We're going to be together. Whatever comes our way, we're going to handle it as a team. And we're always going to be positive and move forward in a positive direction. Uh, Bob, when we first heard about the bubble, when the bubble first started, some of the players were uh, sending tweets and doing Instagram posts, things of that nature on social media, uh, speaking on the um, the accommodations and the food and things of that nature. As someone who was there, what were the accommodations? What were the food? What was the food like? Was it uh, all good, or was it you know some of the negativity we've heard? <laughs> no, 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 no. That's you know what, Keith. That's a really good question. So let me tell you, right? So you saw a lot of those posts like day one, right? And the longer the teams were into the bubble, all of a sudden you didn't see any of those two uh, two (laughs) anymore. Actually, I thought that was Adam Silver laying the smackdown saying, you guys better shut up. (laughs) 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 Hey, hey, he's a great commissioner now. I give him mad props. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. It was different because once you first got to the bubble, you had to stay quarantined in your own room anywhere from 36 to 48 hours. So the biggest adjustment was they would literally pack breakfast, lunch, and dinner for you, knock on your hotel door, and then you'd have to give them like 30 seconds to a minute for them to walk (laughs) away. And you you were eating everything basically out of like styrofoam type servings. 
Now, once you got out of quarantine, all the teams had their own private meal rooms. And then the food was great. Like for lunch or dinner, you would always have a fish, a beef, a chicken, two or three different starches. You could, you could not go hungry. Wow. And the more that we got out of that initial quarantine period, the food was really, really good. It was good. Virtue. So, so I have one question related to that. So who was the one player you had to tell him to stop eating? <laughs> no, 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 no I got the no, I got the answer for that, and the answer is pretty quick. It's the guy you're talking to, Bob <laughs> Uh <laughs> Okay, so now we got to know. Of, of course, we called T Big T because he was going to ask a food follow up. So Absolutely, he's got to keep on. So, what was your what was your guilty pleasure? What was the thing you couldn't put down, Bob? Because now we need to know what what, what what got you. Well, I'll tell you. So we were down there for about two weeks. And then basically there was for every team and there were six teams in our hotel, they would have a meal room and all six teams would have their individual meal room down this little hallway. But once you walk at the end of the hallway, the thing that got me, they had the soft serve ice cream station. Oh man. Oh, yep, gotta it. do it. Gotta do it. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Yeah. I'll be right behind you. <laughs> they had the vanilla, the chocolate, and the twist, and you could like, yep, you could get yourself a big old bowl every every hey. night if you wanted to. I'd have Sprinkles. been boxing you out. I'd have been boxing you out. <laughs> yeah. You wouldn't have been able to get to it. I'd have got all the rebounds. <laughs> I got inside position. <laughs> But you you know you just said something, Bob, too, that's interesting. Because as an observer, we watched as the bubble started to go on. The the players started to get a little ornery. They started to get a lot more chippy. You know, you're talking about <laughs> six teams were in the same hotel. What was the yeah. dynamic in the bubble? Because it's just not natural for NBA players to be in the same place for that amount of time. You know, it was interesting, too, because we had a game with New Orleans. And... At that time, both New Orleans and ourselves were fighting to get to that ninth seed. Mm -hmm. And we played a really competitive game on the court. We end up winning the game. Now we come back, and both of us are eating dinner literally <laughs> right across the hallway <laughs> from each other. So it felt weird, I, I have to admit, because usually when you play in an NBA game, you play the game, you're in your own facility, they're on the bus, they're traveling, or we're on the bus, we're traveling. Guys go back with their families at the end of the end of the game, and it was just an entirely different dynamic. And to be quite honest with you, a lot of times guys didn't know how to react. Like, there's a lot of respect in the community, amongst the players, amongst the coaches, but I got to say, it did feel a little bit weird. It did. It did. <laughs> During the uh, during the um, the games, were you doing? Uh, of course, you were trying to make the playoffs, and I understand how deep that was. But was there any time where you were using that time or, or to, to develop players as well, or find out you know where you were going for next year, or who was a uh, or who were players that to, that you would look at and take take on a serious role next year on your team as well? Well, um, you're always evaluating, you know. And when we've got into our last two games. We were mathematically eliminated, so we had no shot of making the playoffs. Uh, the one thing that Coach Walton did is um, he still wanted the guys to understand, hey, we're going to go out there and we're going to play, and we're going to have a game plan, and you're expected to follow the game plan. He really handled it and approached it with the guys as professional as you could be. And – you know, there were certain expectations placed on the guys, just like it was a normal regular season game. I will say this. We had um, a very talented young man, Daquan Jeffries, who was a two-way player for us, and he took full advantage of his opportunity down there. He, uh, he really opened up a lot of eyes. He played great down there. So we gave him some additional longer looks in those last two games, and – it gave us more of an opportunity to see him on the floor, mm -hmm. but he earned those minutes because he really, really competed in practice and carried over to the game time that he did get. And, and you look at a guy like Daquan, because I want to piggyback off what Keith was saying, because we were wondering this. Like, we, we, guys like you, they felt like playoff games right away because you guys were competing in the bubble. The whole reason of being there is competing in the bubble. 
Do you think that was a playoff like atmosphere that will carry over to next year? Cause you know, they talked about like, you know, you look at the first, some of the first round games, some of those teams that were competing actually beat some of the favorites cause they had, they had to be playing really, really well. Do you think any of that can carry over to next year, especially for the young guys and you guys got a young team? Well, I think, I think unfortunately there's so much uncertainty of when next year is going to start. And I think whenever you can get yourself on an NBA floor and play well, it's going to help your individual confidence level. Um, but every year really starts a new year because inevitably all those teams are going to have change. And when they do have change, there's going to be new guys coming in. And when new guys come in, it's almost like you've got to start all over again from ground zero. Um, and it was different, too. Like, for example, like I tipped my hat to Phoenix. Phoenix went undefeated in the bubble. And their approach was we've got to win every game. Um, and they did, a, they did a great job with it. The Lakers now and the Clippers, teams that pretty much, as soon as they got in the bubble, knew what their playoff seating was going to be, their approach was a lot different than what the Sacramento Kings approach was going to be. Like, you could just tell they were trying to get to their rhythm. They were trying to get different combinations out there. A guy like Deion Waiters and J.R. Smith were added to the team, and they needed to try to find out right, who could play well with one another. So I think their approach was a little bit different than some of those teams trying to get to the playoffs. So, so Bob, the, uh, the environment there, the court, the setup, the virtual fans, uh, all of that. Yeah. How, 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 how much of an impact was that? Was it an impact or was it not an impact? Did it, you know, make a difference? How long did it take you and or the players to adjust if it was? Well, it was different, right, Seth? It was different because we didn't really experience that prior. But again, the NBA did such a great job with the setup. So, they would also have home teams and visiting teams. So if it, if it was our home game, for example, they would pipe in music that we usually play at our home games. Mm -hmm. And they would have the electronic boards with the same type footage that would show at a normal Sacramento home game. And that was really, really good. I thought they did a great job across the court everything was blackened out so it's almost like you're playing in the staples center against the lakers how they have their court set up and then the more games you played in that environment the more use you got um to it and then all the energy was really generated by your team like guys pulling for each other guys cheering one another on that's where the energy came from. And I think every team did a really, really good job of just kind of generating their own energy for their own team. Yeah, we found out which teams really liked each other in the bubble, Bob, to your point. So as an example. Yeah, you can out real quick. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. It was so, Bob, so Bob, I want to go back to the direction the Mo was going and talking about the future. I think you guys got a couple of key building blocks with De'Aaron Fox and Marvin Bagley Jr. in. With the draft lottery being set and with everybody kind of know where you're picking, what direction do you see Sacramento kind of going in, building around those two players? Well, I think both of those young guys are extremely talented guys. I really, really felt for Marvin because Marvin had been practicing exceptionally well, and he had a freak injury. So, unfortunately, he didn't even get the opportunity to play because he really had a severe ankle injury. He's going to heal from it fine. But in two years, Marvin has only played in 75 games. Hmm. And his development has been a little bit slow just because of the um, injuries that he's had. But I really like his talent level. I really like his attitude and approach. He works. He wants to be good. And we just got to find a way just to kind of keep him healthy and on the floor. And I think De'Aaron Fox um, – has done a really, really good job. Now, his player developmental coach, Rico Hines, really invested a lot into him, and his offensive game just really took off. Uh, 
And again, you know, I, I, I have a tendency to kind of look more at the defensive end of the floor. Both of those guys are going to have to bring more physicality into the game at the defensive end. But their talent base and their level of wanting to be good really suggests that they could be special players in this league. Hey, uh, as a Knicks fan, I got something to say about some of your players. Uh -oh. uh, <laughs> tell them to leave my teammates alone and mind their own business. First things first. Don't be talking about my teammates. We got our own problems. We don't need yours. All up in, the, all up in our business. Thank you for not responding to that. Just let me go. On. <laughs> and the second question is serious, on a serious note. Um, you know, Mo is our big man, and we always throw the ball into our big man to start to get to start our podcast. That's how we do it. The question I want to ask you is: Do you still think, in the advent of small ball and uh and uh, seven footers shooting three pointers, do you still still think the ball the game is played from the inside out, or in uh or in this new era of basketball has that totally changed? Well, I think it all depends on the players you have on your team. I will say this though. I think you've got to look at it inside out a little bit differently. It's not like there's as many dominant low post players as there once was. Kids are being raised a lot differently now. Kids are being raised, get to the arc, shoot the ball, be a really good shooter. But take a look at the Houston Rockets, for example. And I think a lot of teams kind of try to play similarly today, the way they do, in that the inside attack is off of the dribble. You've got to be able to break your man down off of the dribble, get into the paint, and then you can kick the ball out to open up the three-point shot. Like if you were to just pass the ball around the perimeter and not go inside with an attacking dribble, you're never going to get a clean, open three-point shot. The players are just too good. The key is you've got to get your inside game going with your dribble, penetration, your drive and kick, your blender game, where you're going to force a second defender to play the ball and then kick out to the open man, maybe then an extra pass, you can shoot the open three. Um, and then if some teams do have like a dominant big man or a guy that they can play through in the post, you know, teams are still going to do that. But there's just not a lot of teams that have that type player um, anymore. So, so, Bob, to that end, because I'm excited. Like, I can have that conversation all day long, especially when you're talking about playing inside out off the dribble. But what I noticed, because these guys are so uniquely talented um, at, one, at the one-on-one -on -one game, there's a lot of standing around on the perimeter. I mean, yeah. Golden State does it a little bit differently, a lot more moving off the ball. But a lot of times it's because a guy can break somebody down and get by. If that second defender comes, then it's the kick. You know, aesthetically as a fan, sometimes it's talented basketball, but it's like, man, I would love to get a little more of that movement back in the game. No, I, I, I totally agree. And um, because those players are so talented off the dribble and guys are so good now or so much better at shooting the spot up three, unfortunately, we see a lot of teams play that way. Um like, for example, you look at a guy like Luka Doncic, right? He gets in there, he plays pick and roll with Porzingis, and then they're going to spot up everywhere else. But it kind of fits their team, you know what I mean? Um, other teams, and I think when you watch NBA games at the beginning of games, you'll see a lot more movement than you do as the game wears on. But I think NBA coaches are saying, okay, we've got to play to our strengths, and we know the three most important shots are the layups, the threes, and the free throws. Free throw. And everyone's trying to generate those for your team now. Yeah, it's, it's funny, too, because there's such a, a youth movement, and it's even coached a little bit different. And, you know, you have an extensive background in college. Real quickly, because I think we really want to touch on the events of the last couple of days in the NBA. Uh, yeah. We all started off, or well, most three of the four of us started off as big, big college fans. Of course, Keith would be the one person. No surprise, it's not a college wow. basketball fan. But uh, the hate? See, see what I got to go through? <laughs> see what I go through? <laughs> But, but what needs to change in college to kind of get some of that lower back? Obviously, if you're talented, we're big believers that you should be able to go to the NBA, period, point yeah. blank. You know, the, no other sport or no other, any, no other business has those restraints. But what, what needs to happen to, to bring some of that luster and lure back to college? Because it's, it's not the same game outside of the tournament at this point. Yeah, you know, it's, um, 
it's an interesting question because I always come back to like, all right, who's getting the players and how are they getting them? And, um, I got you know, you've got it. <laughs> I know how they're getting them. You want to talk about it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm out of that game. I'm out of that game. <laughs> we can no. talk about it. Let's put it out. No. Bob, Bob, please continue. <laughs> sir, no, 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 sir, As please continue. As you were continue. saying, Bob. Yes, yes, Bob, please, there. <laughs> but, you know, sometimes if – you know that you're getting players not the way you should be getting them. And it kind of falls back on the NCAA saying, okay, that program shouldn't be allowed to keep getting them that way. And I know that's easier said than done. And there's going to be certain blue bloods of college basketball. Um, The thing that's really concerning to me is the number of transfers now in a given year. Uh, I remember when I was in in college basketball, it would be rare to see, you know, maybe 100 transfers in a year. Now you look at the transfer list and guys are transferring at the drop of a hat. You can see a 1,000 guys transferring right now. So I don't know if the NCAA needs to adjust the transfer rule or not. Um, but I think that's affecting college basketball and not in a positive way. Um, and I just wonder about the NCAA too, like, you know, they they still are the governing body of college basketball. And I think sometimes maybe some of the rules that they have on the books right now need to be reexamined and adjusted to help the game be better and to help get the kids and help the kids out at the schools that they're at. And, you know, I always say, do you pay the players in college? I say, you know what, if they're generating money for the school, they should be able to receive something. If their jersey is going to hang in the bookstore, and then that university is going to make X number of dollars off of that jersey, and that poor young player isn't getting anything back from it. I, I always – think about that and it just doesn't seem right it doesn't sit well with me you know and um maybe those little subtle adjustments will help the college game in the sense that you get more talented players anxious and eager to get to college play the college game and not necessarily transfer to another college or try to leave school and get to the nba game when some of them aren't quite ready to get there yet yeah you're uh these guys know you're going to get me started. On the I, I was wondering. Yeah. I, I didn't even have to you say are, anything that, that was coming out of you. We knew you were coming. Uh-huh. Oh, man, yeah. <laughs> but because, uh, I, I, Bob, I completely agree with every, everything you said. And I think with the NCAA, what we're seeing right now with college football specifically is an issue, is a byproduct of, of what you just said in terms of, of, uh, of paying the players. Because if there was some system right now set up where they were able to pay these players, some of the, the, the hurdles that they're facing right now in terms of college football and whether or not it could proceed or not would be easier to overcome. But the NCAA hasn't addressed that and they haven't addressed a lot of other issues um, and it's causing them problems right now. No, it totally is. And, and you know, you've got to give credit where, credit where credit is due. Like these athletes, especially in football and basketball, you're, they're generating so much money for the individual institutions. And like the NCAA tournament was wiped out this year because of the COVID. And just think about how much money was lost during that tournament. But then they still want to refer to the players as the amateurs. I get it. <laughs> I understand the value of a scholarship room and board, education paid for. But in today's day and age, it sure seems like they should be getting a lot more than just that. Yeah, enough of this college nonsense. The Sacramento Kings <laughs> making the playoffs next year. <laughs> let's, just, let, let, let's, get back, let's get back into this, man. <laughs> That's always going to be the goal now. That's yeah. always going to be the but- goal. But you know what point, you know, KJ, to your point, though, I think that's a good segue to kind of the events of the last couple of days, right? So, Bob, when we scheduled this with you, we knew we were going to talk a lot of hoops, a lot about the bubble. But but we started this podcast giving Adam Silver a lot of credit. And I think what Adam, you guys, the NBA as a whole and the NBA Players Association have done a really great job, not only with the bubble playing, but also social issues. And the NBA continues to lead the way. 
Um, you know, we saw, you know, whether you want to call it a boycott or a strike yesterday in the league. And that was the, the precipitous for a lot of things that happen in not only just the world of sports, but the world in general. You know, as someone who's, you know, works in the NBA, you see these players every day, you hear the conversations, you help mold and shape these young men. What was your opinion um, when you saw the events of yesterday take place? I, I was just so proud of the guys for doing what they did, having the conviction to do it. And I say this, I know I'm a little bit biased, but out of all the professional sports, the NBA is the best run professional league because our commissioner is not afraid to listen to the players. He always has, right? I remember going back to uh, Donald Sterling when he was the owner of the Clippers mm -hmm. and Adam Silver generated and got information and then he came out and made a controversial decision one that Donald Sterling could no longer uh, be an owner in the NBA he took input from other owners he took input from coaches he took input from players and that's how he does his job and we all have our separate unions, right? So the players have their union. The owners are led by our commissioner. There's a coaches union, there's an officiating union. But to me, there's really good synergy amongst all of those groups. And the man at the top, um, you know, Commissioner Silver does a really good job of letting voices be heard. And he's not gonna rush to judgment and as a coach, right, working with an NBA player, I always tell our guys, this is a partnership, right? We're going to put in a game plan to go out and win the game. There's going to be a lot of times I want input back from you on maybe the best way to defend this pick and roll. And our commissioner does the same thing. He wants the league to be successful. He knows it's a partnership. And he's going to do everything in his power to get everyone on the same page and pulling in the same direction. Hey, let's face it. What happened the other day with Milwaukee not taking the court and the other two games being canceled? It was unprecedented. Absolutely. That has never happened in professional team sports. And, you know, I had a couple conversations earlier today. And to me, the players just felt, their message wasn't being heard enough. And again, the NBA did a good job by putting Black Lives Matter on the court, by allowing players to wear different nameplates. And I think being in the bubble, I think some of the players had a concern, even though they could still address the media before and after games in the bubble, that their message was being lost a little bit. And for them to take the action, specifically led by Milwaukee, um, and with everyone else following suit and being unified amongst the players over the Jacob Blake shooting, it just really shows how together the league is and how willing they are looking to make a statement and use their platform for social justice. Yeah, couldn't be more proud of the guys. Seth, I know you Yeah, I, I was, uh, like Mo said, I mean, I had that feeling of, of being proud and, and super impressed and, you know, just really started to think about, like, the decision and what they had to go through to make that decision and how difficult it was and the things that they were giving up in order to do that. Um, you know, because I think in anything in society, you go through ups and downs, and if you hit a lull, you have to do something sometimes drastic to make sure that that message is getting heard and the timing was right for it. But again, I mean, the sacrifice that those, those players made was, was, uh, was significant and unprecedented, like you said. So I was, I was super, super impressed. Uh, and like you said, I've been impressed with uh, Adam Silver as well. It's just, you know, to, for me, it's amazing because when you have a, a leader that listens and seems to lead with morals and ethics and conviction, good things seem to happen. If we had that in other levels of our society, I think we'd be a lot better off. I, so, I, I, I totally agree with that. Sorry, Mo. Sorry, Mo. No, no, yep. please go for it, please. No, the only thing I just wanted to add to that is that, so they made a decision not to play 
one night of games. And that led over to a second night where they're not going to play games. So a lot of people says, well, what is that going to do? But if you turn on any TV station, it doesn't have to be just a sports station. This is now a national story. And it has brought even greater awareness. Um, Coach Rivers, Doc Rivers, when he came out and had his speech, right? I mean, incredible. He's the son, and one of his parents was a police officer growing up. He's seen both sides of it, and he spoke from the heart. So some commissioners may try to just move on, right, and just let that go, but it became a national story. And I think our commissioner, our leadership embraced that and really kind of got in touch even more so what the players are feeling. And there's just great awareness right now amongst our group. And like we said, just so proud of our guys for doing something that's never been done before. Uh, would, uh, did any, any of the players discuss any fears about um, repercussions or, uh, or uh, uh, you know, any, any, any negative actions coming back on the back end of this? I mean, we all know what happened to Colin. Is anyone worried about what might happen as a result? Well, I, I, I'm sure they had those discussions. Uh, I just wasn't privy to a lot of those conversations. But here's the other thing I'm really happy about. They're going to continue to play games right now. And I think that's extremely important because I know there's a lot of players in the NBA that could go back to their communities, could have a direct influence on their communities, and would do wonderful things in their communities. There's no question about that. But I look at it like there's going to be so much attention on the NBA playoffs that they can use the games and the bubble format to even send a greater message unified with those guys that are still playing, still in the bubble. So I'm happy that the games are going to restart. Number one, because I love NBA basketball and I love the playoffs. But more importantly, the message is not going to die. It's still going to be on the forefront of all the media. Love that perspective, Bob, because, you know, we, we watch the pundits and – all the talking heads on TV and they all have their perspective where they've done nothing that, uh, you know, nothing like these NBA players have done, you know, but it's really easy for them to sit in their seat, make a lot of money and spew kind of nonsense at these guys. But my question to you is where does that character come from? Because we saw two generations ago, some of those guys didn't do it. We saw a generation ago, these guys didn't speak up. And this has been a young person's, when you look at the Black Lives Matter movement and a young player's, when you look at the NBA movement um, initiative. And I'm just proud, because I go back to think of myself at 20, 21, even 25. And I don't know if I had the character that these guys have, especially when you consider some of their backgrounds, not going to college like we talked about. This is truly impressive, Bob. So So where does that character come from? Well, I I think the day and age that we live in now was social media. And I know this on the Kings team. Like we had uh, some Zoom conversations and guys are active learners. And I think guys do not just want to live in their own world. They want to talk to one another. Hey, what did you experience? Yeah, that's what I experienced. And there's a lot more dialogue and conversation about it. And they know right now that they do have a voice. They feel that they have a voice. And when they continually see what's happening, and in specifically in the Black community where these things continue to happen, they are strong in the sense that it is time for us to really move forward and try to make a change. Now, I've never seen in my life, I'm 58 years old, the way the George Floyd killing really resonated worldwide. It became global. And that was such a platform to jump on and get things moving in a direction And guys just really kind of threw themselves into the cause. And I think, again, that's awesome, you know, because a lot of times that may be viewed, it might be seen, and within two weeks, it could totally be forgotten about. But it hasn't. And it's touched 
this country and it's touched a number of countries throughout the world and the young players, right? They are really, really feeling almost an obligation that, okay, there it is. It's right in front of us. We've got to make the change. We've got to help do things in our power with our platform to get more people aware, open up people's mind, educate them as best we can and get some reforms going here. That is awesome. Um, uh, one statement that was made earlier was managing the 17 personalities. And as it relates to like the Black Lives Movement, all 17 personalities may not agree with the statements in the movement that's going on. From a coaching perspective, how do you kind of manage those personalities when it relates to the movement or social injustice that's just going on in the different viewpoints? Yeah, I think that's fine. You know what? I think everyone's entitled to their opinion and their viewpoint. Um, like, for example, we've had a couple players on our team that grew up in Serbia and they have not grown up in this country, not knowing everything um, that we know as Americans growing up in this country. That they grew up in a separate country. So that's fine. And I give those two guys, um, um, Belizia and Bogdanovich on our team, they try to educate themselves. Hmm. And again, I want to go back to this point because it's a big thing. Like when you're on a team, it is a family and you're going to support your brothers and our guys will support one another as long as they know what's going on. They may not necessarily always agree and say, okay, that's the step you're going to take. Okay. I'll do the same thing, but they're going to respect the step. They're going to educate themselves and it just really open up really good dialogue. So, you know, you can't really force guys to do anything, nor would you want to, but you just got to, again, provide an opportunity for them to open up dialogue so they can learn from one another and, again, get everyone moving in that same direction. Yeah, but it really is funny, though. I'm only laughing because it really is like a family. And we used to say, you know, kind of growing up in the inner city of Detroit, if you get into a fight, I'm fighting and we'll figure out what was going on later. You know what You're I mean? Right. And that's <laughs> kind of the approach, yeah. you know, no that you see these guys no taking. Yep. Coach first, ask questions last. Just make sure nobody come <laughs> off the bench because you get suspended nowadays for <laughs> yeah, stuff now like that. Suspended. Actually, Bob, that's your job, ain't it? That's just a coach. <laughs> yeah, I'm the assistant that can't move that fast, so I let the young guys do that. <laughs> <laughs> I try to be the peacemaker. <laughs> So, so on one serious note, and then we will have, we'll have a little fun with you, Bob, before we let you go. Where, where, do, you, where do you personally want to see this thing go? Because there's a lot of ammunition and energy, and these players are on top of it, man. Just, again, continue to be impressive. But where do you guys want to see it go as a league, as a Kings organization, and with the players? Well, I, I think right now the platform is, is at a really good place, right? And, you know, people who were not, even brought in to the discussion are now brought into the discussion. So the Milwaukee Bucks were able to get the governor involved in the conversation. Mm -hmm. They're able to get law enforcement officers into the discussion. And what I personally want to see is to continue to get people talking, get people to open up their minds and continue going on a path where the, con the hard conversations are going to be had. I mean, it's easy, right, to say, oh, yeah, yeah, it's all good. I'm good. How you doing? Yeah, you're good. Okay, good. I'm good. And then just forget about it. And I think where we're at as a league, I think guys are willing to have those hard, hard conversations, and they're willing to reach out to people, the lawmakers, the business corporate sponsors to really have discussions that can not only help the NBA, but help our society as a whole. Absolutely. C couldn't have said it better okay. ourselves. Yeah. I mean, just profound words. And again, to have somebody like you that's on the forefront with these players, we, we appreciate it. But before we let you go, we play a few games on the Grey Bears podcast. And oh, one man. of the games, oh. this 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 will be easy because you have intimate <laughs> knowledge of this game. Uh -oh. So one of the games is, is Sojo's, and we call it Sojo's Over Under. 
and we played this a few weeks ago and it relates to the bubble. It relates to where we started the conversation. And the question from, from Seth was over under $5,000, the amount of money you would pay to sit courtside at one of the bubble games. And I personally said I would pay over $5,000 to sit at one of those games. But as somebody that was in the bubble, we need to know from you, was that experience, if we were a fan, worth $5,000? Over, over, <laughs> over. over. Yeah. Oh, it was, so yes, worth. Bob. Oh, I'm not buying it. I'm not yeah, buying yeah. it. See, I don't buy not, nothing to come out of that Sacramento bank. He, hey, he's a guest. He's a guest. <laughs> Let the man talk. Yeah. Let the man talk. He said his piece. Nah, Let come on, man. I, I, need, I need you to call my dad, Bob, because when he heard I said over $5,000, he killed me for that. So. <laughs> you want to talk about a lifetime experience, mm -hmm. and then the guys, if they saw, like, a fan there courtside after not seeing fans, they would embrace you so much, they'd make you like a lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. That's a good point. Oh, man. I that's didn't even think point. about that. Yeah, that's, that's a, a good great point. point. Great yeah. point. point. That's a good point. You're all right, Bob. I'm going to root for you 80 games in a season. <laughs> 80, 80, 80 games. 80 games. I got you. <laughs> Plus, Bob, I want to thank you for holding out Detroit for four years, too. I appreciate you know being from Detroit. No, you know what? I enjoyed Detroit when I was there, you know? And then we got to open up the new arena down there. And yeah, absolutely. I still, I still say to this day, we could have stayed healthy with Reggie Jackson. And when we got Blake, you know, Tobias, Marcus Tobias. Morris, you know, yeah. if we could have kept everyone healthy. You sound like a new fan. To this day. <laughs> oh, see, here you go. <laughs> if we could have stayed healthy, if we, if. <laughs> that's, no, 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 no. That's professional sports. That's how it is. Yeah. I know. So, so we'll, we'll, we'll let you go on this, Bob. Who's the one guy, and we'll take, we'll take like the LeBrons and Jordans out of it. Who's the one guy that you wish you would have coached, that you would have been on the Ooh. bench watching that player day Ooh. in and day out? All time. Yeah, you know what? I, 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 I'm going to direct this a little bit differently. So. Okay. I was at Texas Tech, and I was working for Coach Knight. And Kevin O'Neill, who I worked with at Northwestern University, gets a Toronto Raptors job. So I go from being an assistant at Texas Tech to now being an assistant coach, my first NBA experience with the Toronto Raptors. And we had um, Vince Carter on our team. Mm -hmm. And that's when Vince was Vince Sanity. Mm -hmm. So. We'd be in practice, and I just remember, like, the first two weeks of practice and coaching Vince, I saw something different and something unique every day of the first two weeks I was there. And I just was like, wow, I was probably like a kid in a candy shop and not really a good coach at that time. <laughs> <laughs> All the things that Vince could do. And now you go around the league in today's, like, environment, and – you're just seeing so many talented guys. You're just seeing so many guys be able to do so much. Um, I have a lot of admiration for their talents, but when you're trying to game plan and trying to stop them, <laughs> that's why I got all these gray hairs right here. Yeah. <laughs> or the, or the gray beard club right here. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Welcome yeah. to the gray beards, the gray beard nation. Yeah, you are officially part of Greybeard's Nation and one of the Greybeard's, Bob. This was an absolute treat. You are welcome back to the Greybeard's Podcast anytime. And like I told you, when you're traveling from Saratoga to upstate New York, dinner and a beverage, even if it's sparkling water, is on us. So we appreciate you. Well, if you're buying, it's going to be more than sparkling water. For <laughs>